So I would like to thank, first of all, my friends, Chris Vaughan, uh, Jerry McKinney, and uh, Kate Eagleson for uh, this nice conference. Uh, what I will try to do is essentially to say in a less elegant way what Sandra has said about complex systems, uh, even if with from a slightly different point of view. Um, so uh, I think that we need a new, a new language in physics for dealing with complex systems that is less founded on parameters like mass, energy, speed, and so on, and much more on constraints, the general states and processes, information sharing and the selecting, differential timing, and the irreversible dissipative events. This is very much relevant for biological systems. Indeed, biology is experiencing a conceptual term that will determine the research strategy of this century. The issue is here to try new foundations of biology centered on concepts like function, information, control, downward position. It is time to overcome the alternative between a pure molecular approach and a pure functionalist one. This approach demands that we deal with class of problems and solutions, and not with single ones. This is the way in which complexity is manageable, also from a, a, a mathematical point of view. Many have given a very important contribution in this direction, and my own work is based on this presupposition. So let me, only I have inserted this slide after the discussion this morning. Let me, let me come back mm, very shortly on this point, because it is very relevant for my position. That is, patterns show order. We have a pattern when the knowledge of a subset of the elements constituting it allows increasing ability to guess the remnant when the size of this subset increase. Patterns cannot be created by chance only. This would be a violation of the second law. This presupposes not only the existence of a previous pattern, but the dynamic ability to generate patterns. And these are the constraints. That there are several examples of that, quantum mechanical systems, complex systems, but we can perhaps see this a little bit. So biological functions. We have biological functions when some fundamental requirements are met. The first is that it does not depend on a structure. Indeed, different structures, the degeneracy you spoke before, can deploy the same function. However, some structural hub is always necessary. For instance, many different wing-like structures are good for flying, but there are some aerodynamic requirements. These are constraints, again. Any functions? is always instantiated in a certain chemical operation. However, it does not depend on that. Quite the opposite. Thanks to formal constraints, again, from above, the operation is controlled in its deploying a function. What means from above? This is the third point. Any function is connected with the needs and therefore the implemented goals of the whole organism. Functions of organism parts do not exist, if not in a metaphoric sense. So functions are of the organism. Moreover, it depends on information codification, DNA, but it's not an immediate consequence of it, as we shall see. So functions require complexity. Complex systems are a particular variety of self-organizing systems characterized by correlations between elements, but not overall correlations. This is very important, all to you, stress at this point. So here is shown the different levels of DNA um, um, up to the chromosome. So they show some interesting properties. The first one is that they are hierarchically organized, meaning A, different levels of order and complexity, B, structure and the webs of relations on each level. This allows for modernization and information encapsulation. That is, for instance, to, 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 have a, to express DNA, you need to unpack the chromatin, the, the, the chromatin of the chromosome. Moreover, um, I will uh, stress that when I say that, uh, uh, that uh, complex systems can define it this way, this is a precise uh, mathematical definition, but I don't have the time to, to deal with that, but probably during the discussion. So moreover, complex systems show both bottom-up effect and top-down position. It is very important to understand that it is impossible to directly act from above or below, if not with the concurrence of dynamic causation modes at the same level, here the mid one. Uh, under consideration, obviously. For instance, an electron, the physical level, can be used for acquiring energy, metabolic need, only if there are chemical reactions, operation able to do that. For these reasons, influences from below are rather conditions of possibilities, that is, varieties. Influences from below are rather formal constraints canalizing certain processes. But we cannot act dynamically from above and below. This is something simply absurd. Motifs. Complex systems show recurrent motifs at different scales, often fractal. 
Here a bacterial colony of Panibacillus dentritiformis after three days growth is shown. Motifs recurrence is fundamental for a self-replicating system. That is, there is a, a physical component in self-replication. Um, moreover, plasticity. Any complex system show plasticity and adaptability or evolvability. The necessary requirement is that no subsystem works optimally. Otherwise, the whole system would fall apart. This means that we have always modularization together with integration and also co-adaptation to the environment, as we shall see. So, hubs, as mentioned, at any level and in any subsystem, complex systems are networks showing hubs. Uh, hubs are those elements of the network that are crucial for its functioning. This implies that we can change or even elim eliminate many elements or connections of the network, as you have shown before, but provided these are not part of the hub, the network suffers no substantial damage. Uh, as said, this is crucial for understanding functions and evolvability. Uh, we have the example of two DNA binding proteins separated by more than one billion years of evolution, East two protein and drosophila and green protein having an almost identical three-dimensional structure and the same function, both are regularity protein of the homeodomain, homeodomain family, but sharing only 17 over, over 60 amino acid residues. So this is, seems relatively clear. So now the, the central point is following. It is impossible to display functionality without information codification. Information codification happens at two fundamental places in the organism. A, in the genome, in which case the code is transcribed in a set of instructions, instantiated by RNA, giving rise to structures like proteins, able to display functionalities. Two, B, in the peripheral sensory system or, or the membrane, where an external physical signal acquires biological significance for the organism, for instance, uh, dangerous or, 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 or good, giving rise to some representational activity connected again with some functionality. Representational activity understood in a very wide sense of the word. Now, let us analyze the first element, that is the, the information codification in the genome. That is, DNA is information codified. As it is known, it can combine in different ways four fundamental letters. This is clear. Now the point is that uh, DNA is also the internal source of variety of the organism. It guarantees both transmission of information over the generation, the generation and mutation, that is variations. Moreover, DNA is a, in a continuous process of reshuffling, recombination, dislocation, and so on, as shown this morning by Paolo and Ivan, uh, this, uh, this afternoon, sorry. sorry. Uh, it is important to understand that none of these activities diminishes or a bit its role of information codification. This is very important to understand. That is, all these changes maintain the ability to codify information. This miracle is allowed by a strict separation between information combinatorics and the chemical bonds. The bases, the, the black the, on, on the right, are not directly connected with each other, but only through the sugar phosphate backbone. This means that the sequence of bases is arbitrary, in other words, and does not depend on the chemistry. The, the, the sequence of the bases is on the same strand, obviously. This is a necessary requirement for having information. Otherwise, we will ne never have information. I mean, if the, 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 the connect, the, if the sequence of bases would depend on chemistry, this would be no information at all. Uh, also, atoms and molecules show a certain combinatorics. However, this combinatorics is not information. There are not alternative ways to build atoms or molecules. It is true that some molecules can be in different shapes, but this is still not a code. We have a pure physical and chemical requirements here, and no, not informational ones. So, the astonishing fact about life is that it is able to connect so diverse aspects as information and function, that is complexity, as I said before. Apparently, there is no connection at all between these two aspects. Why should a certain sequence of bases code for a specific protein? What is not understood is that information expression, or DNA expression, if you, if you like, gives rise to a whole dynamic process in which the building of the protein is the final step. The final step. It is a process. This, it is this process that has been selected. That is the whole process, not single elements. 
This would be totally incomprehensible if we do not consider that selection always operates together with formal constraints. Selection canalizes a process along a certain path, but the constraints guarantee that such a process is not undermined by perturbation coming from other processes that occur plus or minus simultaneously. This is also the reason of modularization, as mentioned. And I shall come back to modularization. So it is also important to understand that mRNA, or RNA in general, represents a set of instructions for building a protein, while DNA represents only codified information. This means that the order of the different bases is crucial. Otherwise, there would be equivocal instruction. Indeed, to, to take an example, the genetic code distinguishes among the following sequences, giving rise to different codons, C, A, U, and so on, all, all the, the, the six combinations, all the six possible permutations of A, C, and U. It is also very important to consider that different permutations of the same triplet never occur for the same amino acid, other, since otherwise this would be again equivocal. And these requirements are detected by pure informational constraints, not chemical ones. So we have how, for instance, the, the, the protein instructions arise, by here is a combination of, of, of glycine and alanine. Uh, you can see that the, the primary structure of the protein still preserves a certain mapping to the original sequence of, uh, of the M uh, RNA or DNA, uh, but it, is, it has no longer an informational value because we have no longer the separation between information and chemistry here, as it is evident by considering the chemical structure. Uh, we have here the, a triplet, the glycine, alanine, and leucine combining together. It is the same, if you will, not, not very specially uh, important, only to show this, this process. And uh, what we have here is what uh, theoreticians in information theory uh, call uh, compositionality without codification. Uh, that is, uh, patterns, for instance, are combined in this way. Uh, when we have a network, in general, patterns are composed, but they do not represent codified information. For instance, when I have a connectionist network, the single units, or the single neurons, if you will, they are still uh, digital devices. Be or they can understand that digital devices. That is, they, it, either they uh, are excited or not. But the whole pattern, it is no longer information codification. It is uh, according, it, it happens according to a pure compositional principle. Here I have shown in a very pictorial way how starting from a, a, a linear sequence, a primary structure, you can evolve until to a quaternary structure or so on. But it is only to, for the sake of, of, it's a very qualitative um, picture. Uh, it is only nice to, to draw it, as you say. Then I, I go to the second element, that is, I have spoken of genome, codification in genome. Now let's, uh, let's see the codification at the membrane, at least for unicellular organisms. The membrane is the selector of the organism. It is what separates and also unites the biological cells with the non cells. It is constituted of two layers of lipids with the head toward water and the hydrophobic tail into the opposite direction. The function of the membrane is to allow controlled exchanges necessary for metabolism with the environment. Without such exchanges, the cell would depend on entropic fluxes controlled from the offsite. This is exactly what happens in the case of the banal cells, that is, of, of self-organizing systems that are not biological. In the case of banal cells, we have this dependence because these are hexagonal cells, structures that arise spontaneously when a lipid trapped between two metal layers is heated here from above. Beyond the critical threshold, banal cells are an interesting example of self-organization, but depend on ex an external heater. This is evident. So they are not able to, to display the functionality of an organism. Obviously, this uh, enormous complicated uh, uh, exchange with the environment is controlled by gate protein that exactly do this job. That is, that, that, that control all the possible exchanges and, and the informational value of the signals received from the theory. Let me then uh, focus on this point that is that this connection between information and function cannot work at all without the ability of the organism to display co-adaptation with its environment 
and to exercise both internal controls on the way in which functions are implemented and about the functional significance of external things. So this is crucial. Uh, so uh, let, let me speak first of bottom-up telenomic causation. We have bottom-up telenomic causation when external perturbation signals are carved out for the needs of the organism. In this case, all the, only the final state to be reached does matter. Any environmental stimulus is in principle noxious as far as it is a threat to the organism's homeostasis. It is only along the evolutionary path or along the developmental path that this signal is carved out by the organism. So, so not with the, the fact that both the genome and the environment are blind to the phenotype as well as, uh, as to each other, the organism is therefore able to carve out environmental perturbation and to ontogenetically and phylogenetically integrate them in its dynamic development or evolution respectively. In this way, feedback circuits are established to which a process of, of co-adaptation goes on. This is, a phys this is e even physics, if you like, but physics is a little bit more complicated because the organism is very complicated. So as far as I can understand, we can speak even of three different feedbacks involved here because uh, we have uh, environmental effects uh, in general acting on, on as, as, as negative feedback because obviously environment, environment cannot be instructive. This is clear and eventually also acting indirectly on the genome, at least by selecting the phenotype. Then, we, but there are also, this is also environmental stress somehow on, on, on the DNA, but this is, this is not very important. We have positive, on the contrary, feedback that is amplification processes starting from the DNA. And then, and this is very important to understand, we have an amplified feedback from the, phenotype, from the phenotype, this black box in the middle, we have amplified feedback against the environment. That is, each time that the organism receives a perturbation from the, stereos, from the exterior, it tries to, to, to uh, counterattack, to counterbalance this perturbation in order to restore its homeostasis. Obviously, this will never completely uh, done, not, never completely performed, because otherwise the organism would have a, a complete control on the environment, which is not the case. <laughs> and obviously also the perturbation would have never reason. On the contrary, this feedback allows that somehow the external signal is integrated in a dynamical process. So let's come now to the second aspect, teleology. I have spoken of teleology. Let's come, let's come now to teleology. Teleology is the top-down ability of the individual, individual organism to control the environment, the environment according to its own goals. So we have a whole, a whole circuit of information control. That is signal coming bottom, bottom, up, bottom up from the exterior, a, a, a codified, give rise, are we, have, we have information acquisition that give rise to certain functionality. And through the metabolic system, this is able to have a certain influence on the way in which the genome is expressed or not, protein are produced with which time and so on. And this is instructional information going to the, uh, going to the, dis the, the, to the displaying of a certain functions. So let me give a very easy example, chemotaxis, by the bacterium E. coli. The, this bacterium provides a beautiful example because it looks for major concentration of sugars in a fluid. It senses its environment for controlling whether it swims in the right direction or not. If not, it will tumble. And in this way, find a new random direction. You see that when it uh, swims straight on the, the top panel, uh, uh, the, the flagella rotates counterclockwise. When it tumbles, the flagella, this is due to the fact that the flagella inverts the, the sense of rotation. So through a series of tumbling, straight swimming, tumbling, it will, be, it will finally find the source. It is a very elementary mechanism, but a very interesting one, I think, also. So it is a pure mechanical input-output computation? Not at all because the whole mechanism is self-regulated. How uh, is it self-regulated? Through the metabolic system, a huge array of chemical reactions whose purpose is to compare and fine-tune levels of concentration of reactants and the timing of reactions. So I have, yes, thank you. I have here, this is the metabolic system. It, we cannot see very well, 
But this is the metabolic system of the E. coli. It's a huge array of interactions. More than 1,000 chemical interactions occurring plus or minus simultaneously. The interesting thing about that is that any metabolism of any organism on the, on the Earth can fit in here somewhere. So the machinery, I will not spend several words on that. The it is well known how the machinery works from a, a chemical point of view. So I'll skip this, 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 this slide. And I go to a, system, a systemic understanding of chemotaxis. To make temporal, com you see that you have a, a, a sort of sensory system above, a regular system below. And the wall uh, framed in red is the organism. Okay, so we have a signal entering the sensory system and an effect, a motor, that is a motor action, rotation of flagella as an output. So to make temporal comparison of chemo effector levels, information acquisition, the bacterial cell requires a sensory adaptation mechanism that cancels chemo receptor signal outputs in static and denominator. No matter what chemo effectors may be present, whether attractive or repulsive, binary codification. This enables the bacterium to reset the threshold sensitivity of the signaling system in order to detect any new change in the chemical environment. It is a true information erasing mechanism. Because boronian motion of the fluid medium can randomly reorient the bacterium, this requires very short responses, resp response latencies, a complex regulation system. It is here that the genetic factors giving rise to instructional information play a role by enhancing and dampening protein productions. Uh, timing is here crucial. These two aspects together constitute the circuit of information control that I have shown before. Obviously, the production of proteins and so on is shown exactly by the previous slide, but I, I need to skip. So, telonomic processes are especially interesting in phylogeny and when new functionalities arise. The molecular or organismic degeneracy of several structures, even in distant species dealing with similar environmental conditions relative to any functions, allows for a pool of pre-existing structures able plus or minus to be used by successive excitation for deploying a certain function. This assures the necessary variability at the start, that is random structural modification, are here the source of variety. Then the fact that any function is a crucial structural hub for displaying itself assures that the subset of this pool will be selected. In other words, variability plus cr crucial structural elements will determine convergence, the issue about which Conway Morris has spoken this morning. Convergence, very important. This is crucial in the so-called Baldwin effect, which requires natural selection operating upon variation in the direction of increasing plasticity for performing more information control, which allows selective adjustments through natural selection upon the organism functions. In other words, there are three general aspects involved here, variation together with natural selection, information control with plasticity, and in between, co-adaptation by functional selection. Information control which is a typical ontogenetic and individual activity becomes the result of a phylogenetic process. Uh, pay attention, the result of the... Instead, during functional, functional selection, many telonomic processes are involved through which the organism is able to give rise to new functionalities. So te te teleology is in, instead much more interest interesting in ontogeny. That these teleologic processes are much more relevant when the action of the individual organism on the environment becomes crucial, as in niche construction. Niche construction can cause a revolutionary inertia and momentum, lead to the fixation of otherwise deleterious alleles, support stable polymorphism where none are respected, eliminate what would be otherwise a stable polymorphism, and influence disequilibrium. As mentioned, this result suggests that the changes that organisms bring about in their niche can themselves be an important source of natural selection pressure and imply that evolution may sometimes proceed in alternate cycles of selective pressure and niche construction. So uh, let me say, I am finishing, let's say that uh, epige let me speak of epigenetic process where these two aspects, teleonomy and teleology, converge or, or play a role. Epigeny is the process to which a complex system comes out starting from some initial instruction. One, 
The, sect, the set of initial instructions allows the building of the first elements that give rise to a cascade process to which pathogens and signals are activated and propagated. Second, the, cell, the cellular multiplication process proceeds by successive and parallel but hierarchical building of different levels of commands and containment, body structure, organs, tissue, single cells. The process is governed by the principle of information accessibility, that is not any information accessible from any point, allowing different level of information encapsulation. Three, during this process, many events happen that have multiple effect, effects, establishing new interconnections and therefore a huge network of shared information, both horizontally and vertically. Four, the organ is characterized by the fact that it actively searches for the environmental cues, temperature, light, food, and so on, that allows its own development. It is here that information control and theological causation come into play assisting epigenome. That is, this whole process has been selected as a process tending to a final stable state, a longer trajectory, where the distance from the final from the final species-specific steady state is minimized also through the active focus of the organism. Uh, I recall my initial sl slide, the first one, so I skip and I go to the conclusion, telling that uh, besides the more technical consideration, I hope to have shown the conceptual relevance of this new language of physics and biology. Biology is rooted in physics, but it simultaneously represents a new level of complexity that cannot be dealt with without a deep consideration of the entrenchment between information and function. Thank you very much. Caro Gennaro, it's so dense. It's, you make it very difficult for us. I don't know how many people were able to assimilate all what you said, but I thought to the extent that I could assimilate you, what you would said, it was terrific. Now, I will uh, ask you to help us to distinguish between teleonomic and teleological processes. And I'm going to tell you where I come from, that probably you do. We know exactly who, who invented the word teleonomy. Colin Pittendrick, in a paper published around 1960, um, biologists, evolutionists included, have been going along with physicists. Teleology does not belong in the realm of science. And then they have discovered they could not live without teleology, because to understand the eye, you have to understand the deserves to see. So he defines teleonomy to refer to teleological processes without using that word, but to exclude the Aristotle notion that future events can be efficient causes of themselves, which of course is not what Aristotle meant by teleology of final causes. So he introduces the term of teleonomy, which means the same as teleology, teleology etymologically, and then from there things moved on in uh, biology um, you know, some people start to use the two terms as synonym, synonyms, like myself, but you don't. So, will you tell us in what way you use one or the other? Thank you, thank you for this question. Um, but it is obviously for me only, uh, I have only tried to distinguish with this probably in part an appropriate words, uh, two different kinds of processes. That is for me, uh, teleonomy uh, is a is a only a particular variety, that is a biological variety, if, if you will, uh, of what uh, already happens uh, at a pure physical level uh, when you have, for instance, with chaotic systems, this happens very currently, when you have a, f a final attractor state. Uh, the only issue is that uh, biological systems being, uh, uh, the way in which I explained, a, a, comp a complex array of information and functions, they are able of co-adaptation. That is, that is, they are able in a not controlled way, this is important to understand, that they, they, are, they do not are able to exercise control in this part of the discussion, but they are able simply to plastically fit to a certain environmental condition and to have a sort of dynamical trade-off between perturbation and previous order. So 
the allelome is a simple the fact that uh, the organism is able to co-adapt, to, 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 to be co-adapt with the environment. The allelology is much more because the allelology demands the ability of the organ of, uh, by the organs to exercise a true informational control on the environment. That is the ability of the single organism to monitor certain parameters and even, even, even to try to determine its environment in one way or the other. We have uh, incredible examples of that. For instance, the plants that they have produced, the, uh, the green plants that they have produced oxygen on our earth is a clear example of that. So the, the, the in the general <coughs> niche construction, that is the ability of the organism to have obviously inbuilt goals because, uh, I mean, one of the problem, one of the, dan the dangers we should avoid in this discussion is to introduce at this level, that is the biological level, any notion of intentionality because <laughs> this is clear. That is, we should try, it is very difficult because the whole field is here a little bit conditioned by pre supposition from many points of view, from many fields, but we should try to find the middle way between a pure mechanistic approach and, uh, and an anthropomorphic one. I mean, we should try to find which is the specificity of biological system. And I think that organism show this ability exactly to, to, to put together uh, very basic uh, bottom-up telenomic processes through which they simply co-adapt with certain external condition and at the same time, uh, control on the environment, or at least an attempt at controlling the external environment. And this is much more sophisticated. But uh, as far as I know, there is no organism that does not display both elements, as far as I know. I even bacteria do that. I was interested in a number of phrases that you used about organisms that pointed to their unity in acting for goals. So you talked about no subsystem can operate optimally, but there needs to be integration of subsystems to the whole and to the environment. Yes. Also, you talked about membrane separating the biological self from the non-self. Yes. And then organisms controlling the environment according to its own goals. Yes. I'm wondering what you think the source of unity is for an organism that allows it to have goals and to act for goals. What enables you to call it a self? This is very co complicated. Um, I can answer in this way. Uh, consider it from a pure physical point of view. Any time that you acquire information, you need a, a original input that, that is a source of variety. It is a processor able to provide for an initial source of variety. Then you need a sort of regulator coupling device, otherwise you are not connected with the input. And you need finally a selector that uh, can also random choose among several solutions, but through the regulator, the middle step, it is able to have some connection with the input. So any random event at the end will tell you something about the input, if you like. So the extraordinary thing about the organism, e even a bacterium, is that it is able to integrate these three, three systems in itself. Because the, the, gen the genome is the, process the processor. It continuously processes information. The metabolic system is the regulator because it, 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 uh, it uh, keeps the whole organs together and even the, the other two different parts and even it, uh, it, 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 uh, it stands for the uh, necessary entropic exchanges with the environment. And third, you have the selector, the membrane, in the case of a unicellular organism. It is an, orga an organism able, a system able to, 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 to provide for a controlled exchange with the, ex the, with the exterior. These three elements constitute the organism, necessarily, as far as I can understand. How this thing is, uh, is a, a reason, I have no idea at all. I would think probably, I would, uh, yeah, I, I would know much more if I would, but I don't know, I don't know. So I can only, my, what I try to do in my, my work is something much more modest, that is showing which are the necessary condition for having organism, life. But I, I don't have the pretension to understand how life is a reason. If I would know that, I think that I would be a Nobel Prize winner, I don't know. But I don't know, simply. If somebody knows here, can, can, can teach me. <laughs> Thank you. A Aristotle wants to say that
say that all organisms, even plants, have a form yes. that gives it unity, which even calls a soul, even in the case of plants, that makes it one being and alive and able to act for itself, for its own goals. They have a self. They have a self, but a biological self. I think that it would, it would be uh, um, it would be inappropriate to anthropomorph anthropomorphize too much uh, biological systems. Biology is biology. It's something that is really not physics and not humanity. It's we, we should understand it in, in its own specificity. Thank, thank you very much.